and I have the great pleasure to introduce you, uh, Dr. Julianne Herbert. She is a doctor in physical therapist, and her presentation today is about return to play after COVID-19 building resilience. Dr. Julianne Herbert, please, is all yours. Take it away. Thanks so much, Loy. I appreciate it. Um, let me see if I can navigate this screen share. All right. Okay. Loy, do you see the, the front screen? Yes, I do. Okay, awesome. Perfect. All right. So as Loy said, um, my name is Julie. I am a physical therapist. Um, I'm also a strength and conditioning specialist, and I do a lot of work within the ACL community, ACL rehab and return to sport. Um, you know, I, I find my passion in helping soccer players just because I was one. Um, <clears throat> I grew up playing all through, um, you know, the records probably. Wow. Um, as well as collegiately, um, I played at UCLA and State, so that always helps me when I do give these presentations. Um, I'm able to kind of get some street credit, I guess, and speak the language and, and get some buy-in. I, I usually give these um, injury prevention lectures um, to players, so it's nice to be able to speak to some of the coaches of Moss Youth Soccer. So um, I'm very appreciative that, that Loy and Rob invited me to talk today. All right. So I gave a presentation to the FC Stars Club um, maybe a week or two ago, um, and I used a similar presentation. This slide. I just had them go on Instagram and kind of respond to this question. If you were injured for eight plus weeks, how would you act when you finally got the green light to play soccer again? Um, and a bunch of the answers I got was, you know, really, really excited. I can't wait to play. I can't, can't wait to be on the field with all my friends. Um, you know, the big thing, though, is that while these kids are super excited to get back onto the field, um, it's important that we kind of moderate the return to sport a little bit. Um, obviously, as a sports medicine professional, um, I look at it with a little bit of a different lens. Um, just, you know, with return to sport, um, you know, what what's going to happen? Um, what's going to present um, in youth soccer players? So, it's no surprise that sudden increases in physical activity often leads to musculoskeletal injury. Um, two prime examples of this were during the NFL lockout and the NBA lockout. Both of them took place in 2011. Um, when the NFL lockout ended, there was you know a 400% increase in Achilles tendon injury. Um, and then with the NBA, when that resumed play, there was a two to 300% increase. Um, or just general ligamentous injuries. Um, so those numbers are um, a little bit terrifying um, for me and for a lot of uh, sports medicine uh, practitioners right now, just because as we move towards return to sport, we're hoping that coaches and um, athletic trainers and physical therapists and strength coaches alike kind of get on the same page to help transition kids back to sport smoothly. Um, so, as I said, the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine worries about a possible, quote, ACL epidemic with return to sport during the current global pandemic. And that's largely due to kids being on the couch for the last eight to ten weeks. Um, and even, you know, the elitist of players will have dropped their physical, ther um, excuse me, physical activity by nearly 50%. Um, so we have to be cognizant of this when going back to practices and games um, so that we can kind of allow for some physical preparation before throwing our players into it full tilt. Um, so the next couple slides, I got these images from an Australian um, doctor of philosophy in kinesiology, um, but it's a very simple concept, so I just wanted to include them. 
Um, and basically what it shows is, you know, in graph A, it shows you going from the floor to the ceiling. So the floor is where players currently are. Um, it's, it's their baseline fitness after eight to 10 weeks of being sidelined and, and confined to the couch. And the ceiling is point B, where they want to be, where where your peak physical fitness is, where um, you can perform for where are you guys? <laughs> 90 minutes in a soccer game. Um, so basically, the steeper the line from the floor to the ceiling, um, or the steeper the slope, the more dangerous it is, the more likely a player is to sustain some sort of musculoskeletal injury. So. Um, in graph B, you can kind of see two lines. Um, when the ceiling is trying, when you try to achieve your peak fitness or your game fitness in a small amount of time, that slope increases um, significantly, and that's kind of where you get into the danger zone. Um, it really does take some time to prepare the body for the demands of soccer. Um, so it's best to, to kind of respect that and, and program out your training sessions accordingly so that um, you don't have overuse injuries and you don't have these ligamentous or tendinous injuries that can occur. Um, you know, so, so as I said, it, the floor is where you are, the ceiling is where you want to be. Worst case scenario is picture C where it shows the basement. And here, this is where, um, you know, players are complete couch potatoes for 10 weeks and drop their level of fitness. So now they're in the basement and it's going to take a little bit more time to get to the ceiling. Um, you know, I know a lot of club programs have been trying to keep in touch with their players and, and you know, kind of do some Zoom workouts or, or keep their players accountable somehow. Um, so it's important that hopefully the kids have not fallen into the basement and been totally sedentary. Um, but again, this just kind of depicts that, you know, you, you want to get from point A to point B and you can't rush it. Um, the body does take time to make some physical adaptations. All right, so Loy, I know that we talked a little bit yesterday um, about the importance of intensity, exercise intensity. So if you want to chime in at any point, obviously feel free. Um, the big thing here is that it's not necessarily the amount of time that you allow somebody to work out um, that's going to bring on physical adaptations. It's really the intensity of the exercise. So, um, you know, when you are programming your training sessions um, with your athletes, Usually, we want them to be working from moderately hard to hard. And if you look at this picture here, um, it's the rate of perceived exertion. Basically, um, we want them to be between the second and the third player. So they're working hard. They're not completely gassed and totally exhausted. Um, you know, they're, they're floating right around that, oh, yeah, this is kind of hard to, yeah, this is hard. Um, this is a really great graph that you can use with some of like your younger players. Um, I frequently have to ask my um, experienced athletes in the clinic, okay, how hard are you working with this exercise? Um, you know, on a scale from zero to 10, what is your effort? And I actually have to frequently bump them up um, because that's one of the challenges with physical therapy is that we often underload our athletes. Um, but I think that during this return to sport, period after COVID-19, um, we don't have to necessarily worry about, you know, bumping up our athlete or, or, or making the exercise harder. We actually have to kind of moderate that it, it's not too hard, that kids aren't just going zero to 100 day one, um, you know, pedal to the metal, thinking that, that they can achieve their, their fitness much quicker than is physically possible. So implications for players. Um, first, I really, I know Loy, I know you're a fan of, of Messi, so we can still be friends. But, um, you know, the reason I threw him on here with his face mask is because FC Barcelona is implementing a lot of these tips. Um, so, you know, when I, when I gave the stars their presentation last week, um, I kind of went through all of these bullet points with their players of how to safely navigate return to sport. 
Um, you know, so, so first and foremost, obviously I, I won't touch on it a ton. I'm going to kind of focus on the physical aspect, but, um, I think it's important to remind players that stress and anxiety during this time is completely normal. Um, and it's completely normal for kids. It's completely normal for adults. Um, it's just a, a big time of uncertainty. Um, so kind of acknowledging that before you get to, to the physical, I think is, is quite important. Um, and along in that vein, you know, focus on what you can control. Um, so you might not have access to the big fancy gym or um, you might not be able to get together with your full team roster just yet. Um, but perhaps you have some dumbbells or free weights laying around the house, some ankle weights, some bands. You also have your body weight. Um, kind of use what you have available to you um, to kind of turn this period of adversity into, um, you know, an opportunity, a, a time to kind of get better. Um, so control the controllables. Um, in that comes social media and phone breaks, just making sure that, you know, you can kind of step away and, and have some semblance of sanity. Um, obviously, Misery love, loves company, so I know that on, on Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok and everything, everyone's kind of freaking out about um, the quarantine. So taking time away from that is quite important. Um, as we move towards some of the physical components, um, breathing and visualization techniques can be quite helpful for players. Um, so just breathing from a stress management um, standpoint, anxiety control, um, as well as visualization techniques. So a lot of research has shown that even just by um, visualizing you taking a penalty kick or visualizing um, yourself exercising, you do get some physical and musculoskeletal and cardiovascular benefit. Um, so telling your players to, to kind of practice some visualization techniques might not be a bad idea, um, especially while the social distancing guidelines are, are still in play. Um, I know I visualize myself running a marathon every day, but I haven't yet gotten that level of fitness, so still working on it. Um, but, you know, that, that fourth bullet point, I think, is imperative. Keeping routine. So another thing that FC Barcelona does is um, right now they're kind of planning their week out. So when a player is supposed to be um, participating in, say, a 90-minute game, then they'll have a 90-minute very hard workout to kind of replicate that game intensity and that match fitness. Um, you know, but say they were supposed to have a short practice, a short walkthrough session, um, then they'll obviously kind of keep it light on that same day. Or if a player is supposed to go through a yoga flow on Wednesdays at 9 a.m., then they're going to plan a very similar mobility workout during that same time. Um, so keeping a routine is, is huge um, and encouraging your players just to, you know, kind of set a calendar on their phone and, and plan out their weekly workouts. And that can be a, a very, a very good tip for um, players. And then the last bullet point is just that exercise is the best medicine. Um, I usually stay away from absolute statements, but I don't really think that anyone can contest that, um, you know, just from an anxiety and stress standpoint, as well as um, making the transition to return to sport a lot smoother. Um, so like we talked about before, just trying to maintain some level of baseline fitness so that you don't fall into the basement. Um, and then make your journey back to peak fitness quite difficult. So, um, you know, just kind of encouraging that your players continue to stay active during this time is going to be quite important. All right. So um, one program that I really, really like and I often recommend from an injury prevention standpoint as well as a strength and conditioning standpoint is the FIFA 11. Um, so FIFA came together with their board of international medical specialists and they came up with this very comprehensive program that um, helps prepare soccer players uh, for the demands of the sport. So it is meant as an injury prevention tool, but it is clearly a performance enhancement tool as well. Um, and then as you can see from the graphic on the screen, 
it's quite effective. Um, so, you know, you can decrease your serious injuries by nearly 48% or your knee injuries by nearly 45%, overuse injuries by more than half. Um, all of those things are going to come into play over the next couple of weeks when we are allowed to, um, you know, start up practices and eventually start up games. Um, so something like this is a really powerful tool to have in your toolbox. Um, I like it because one, it works, it's effective, right? The data doesn't lie, the numbers are there. Um, two, it has pictures. Um, it has the correct way to do certain exercises and then it has the incorrect way. Um, so I'm a very visual person. I know a lot of the athletes are. Um, so this can be quite beneficial to them. Um, the last reason I like it is because it's free. Um, if you Google FIFA 11, it'll pop right up. It's like the first PDF that will, um, you know, populate in your Google search. Um, and what you can actually do is you can save and download that PDF and you can save it onto your computer, you can save it onto your cell phone, um, and then you can kind of go to the gym or you can obviously now kind of stay in your home and go through the workout. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic resource. It has your sets and your reps. Um, like I said, a whole bunch of graphics of yes and no pictures. Um, so it can be a really, really powerful tool for coaches and players to have. Um, you know, initially the FIFA 11 was meant as a 15 to 20 minute warm up that could take place before practices or games. Um, but your athletes can also turn this into a full, you know, 45 to 60 minute workout if they really kind of break down every exercise and they do three sets of the prescribed reps. Um, it can actually turn into a really fantastic um, injury prevention workout. So I know I mentioned before the American Society of Orthopedic Sports Medicine worries about a, a possible ACL epidemic, um, you know, and that's just because kids have been on the, the couch and their activity level has dropped significantly over the last three months. Um, so I've just included a couple of slides on ACL injuries. Excuse me. So. Every year during a non-COVID year, there's between 100 and 300,000 ACL injuries in the United States every year. Um, I think that this statistic is actually a little bit dated. I think it's, it's closer to the 250 to 300,000, so on the higher end of that number. It's most prevalent under the ages of uh, 25. You know, we see a ton of athletes between maybe 14 and 18 years old in our clinic with ACL injuries. Um, and that's just because, you know, these bodies are, are going through puberty, they're going through different musculoskeletal changes, um, and they're not adapting uh, quite well, and that can result in injury. Approximately two-thirds of these injuries happen with high-risk sports. So soccer is a high-risk sport. Any sport that involves a lot of cutting, change of direction, or jumping. So, um, you know, basketball is going to be up there, lacrosse, field hockey. Football's up there from a contact standpoint, but um, you know most of these injuries are non-contact in nature. So they happen when athletes are changing direction suddenly, they're they're pivoting, um, when they're decelerating or they're slowing down, or when they're jumping up or landing from a jump. So usually it's an athlete's own um, biomechanics or or own movement patterns that actually leads to injury, um, as opposed to contact with another player. And so doctors right now are, are currently worried that with three months on the couch that movement patterns are going to be a little bit um, less ideal than they normally would be. You have some deconditioning, detraining of certain stabilizer muscles um, and biomechanics can kind of fall apart leading to more ACL injuries. So I know we all know who that is. Alex has also suffered an ACL. She may have had two. Um, you know, but it's a really common problem and, you know, I, I talk to my patients often about how it's often seen as a rite of passage for, um, like, female soccer players in specific. Um, and I'll talk about that in a couple slides of why females are much more likely to tear an ACL than a male. Um, but it is important to note that when we come back from the COVID-19 stay-at-home order that 
um, you know, the playing field is, is kind of level. Everyone's going to be coming back from the same detraining, um, the same deconditioning effect. So, um, you know, we're going to have to be very good about slowly easing our athletes into play. So who cares? Um, you know, usually when I tell athletes the, the billions of dollars in the United States that are spent on, um, you know, varsity athletics and ACL reconstructions, nobody has any idea of what that means. And I don't have any idea of what that means because I will never see a billion dollars. So I kind of break it down into um, what one ACL rupture costs. Anywhere from 17 to 35K, and that's going to be including um, co-payments from doctor's visits, physical therapy co-pays, different equipment, so you need a brace or perhaps like an ice machine, um, as well as, you know, all of the other um, things that go into ACL rehab. So luckily, we have health insurance that covers a large majority of that cost, but um, you still have to pay your deductible. It's a big out-of-pocket cost for, um, for parents. And then when we talk a little bit more about um, why players should care, because obviously a lot of youth soccer players are not going to be footing the bill, um, but you lose your entire sports season. So most research is pointing towards nine months of rehabilitation before a return to sport following ACL reconstruction. So in nine months, you'll miss a season. You might miss two. Um, decreased scholarship funding, obviously, that goes more towards collegiate athletes. Um, it's not ethical, and it shouldn't happen within the NCAA, but it certainly does happen, and I've definitely seen that happen um, you know, throughout my own career. Lowered academic performance, obviously, you know, when athletes, when, when the kids cannot play soccer, um, they're bummed out, right? It's stressed out, depressed. It's, it all makes sense. It's, it's, it's a normal reaction, but oftentimes you also see lowered academic performance just because of, you know, disinterest of being in the classroom and um, doing homework and that kind of thing. Um, and that goes hand in hand with your psychological turmoil. So as I just mentioned, the depression and anxiety goes up, you know, I think two to four fold in these athletes. Um, as well as long-term disability and significantly greater risk of osteoarthritis later in life. Um, so I'm kind of dealing with the latter two points in this um, slide. Um, I've actually had four ACL reconstructions of my own. Um, I guess I failed to mention that in the introduction. So um, that's kind of why I find passion in um, injury prevention in general, but um, rehabilitating ACL deficient athletes. Um, and right now I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm 28. Um, I had my first ACL when I was 16. Um, so, you know, about 12 years ago, I'm kind of dealing with some of this long-term disability and significantly greater risk of osteoarthritis piece um, right now. So I just think it's important from an education standpoint. Um, and that's kind of why I go around the clubs in mass to, to kind of talk about the importance of injury prevention. All right, so that is um, a past teammate of mine. Ellie Krieger played with me at Penn, or she played at Penn State. Um, she often came and visited and, and kind of jumped into training sessions and that kind of thing. Allie has had, I believe, two ACLs as well by now. Um, so I always like to kind of throw her into the presentation um, as just a, a model of somebody that can kind of overcome the odds and, and still play at a very, very high level. Um, but, you know, what this slide is talking about is, um, you know, Webster and Hewitt in 2018 did a meta-analysis to see if injury prevention was effective. And what they found was, yes, it absolutely is effective. You can decrease an athlete's risk of ACL injury by nearly half with some of these um, programs. And then perhaps the more staggering statistic was you can decrease a female athlete's risk of non-contact ACL by nearly two thirds. Um, you know, so if, if three girls on your team are supposed to tear their ACL, then you can literally, you know, save two of them from doing that just by implementing simple injury prevention programs like the FIFA 11. Um, so components of effective injury prevention. 
Um, there are a lot out there. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, obviously, lower body strength, core strength, plyometrics, which are jump drills. So learning how to jump correctly, but perhaps more importantly, learning how to land correctly, um, you know, from a vertical jump as well as change of direction or cutting drills, agility drills, that kind of thing. Um, you know, another, I think his name was Patushak and his colleagues in 2018 did another meta-analysis where they looked at different injury prevention programs and they tried to identify um, similar components or themes in each program that was effective. Um, so what are the most important pieces of injury prevention programs to help decrease an athlete's risk of injury? Um, you know, what that team found was three specific exercises are quite important. Um, they found Nordic hamstrings, which are an eccentric hamstring exercise. I'll show you. I have a bunch of clips coming up of these various exercises. Um, and all of them are also in the FIFA 11, um, you know, coincidentally. Um, so Nordic hamstrings, calf raises, lunges, and then, um, you know, as the number of plyometric drills or jump drills went up, the more effective the program was. So what I typically tell my athletes is that jumping and cutting or changing direction, you know, these are skills. Um, but unfortunately, nobody ever really teaches us these skills. We kind of learn these skills when we are little, and then we carry those movement patterns with us for life. Um, so it's important to know that when you are implementing the FIFA 11 or any kind of injury prevention program, there's a bunch out there. There's the sports metric with, there's the Santa Monica PEP, um, you know, there's the FIFA 11 that you are looking at quality of movement, right? So we're looking specifically at jumps and at landings, as well as at change of direction um, and, and providing the appropriate, you know, verbal cues and input that's necessary to kind of correct form. So like I said, I have a couple of video clips coming up in the next slides, and I can kind of show you some of the cues that I give athletes and that, um, you know, coaches alike can kind of give athletes to help decrease risk of injury. Um, but I think that's a, that's a very important part um, is that you don't just have your athletes, um, you know, haphazardly going through some of these exercises that they're really focused on really good quality reps um, before progressing to anything, um, you know, too advanced. All right. so. For lower body strength, um, you know, these, these videos are filmed at where I work currently. Um, I work at Athletic Evolution. Uh, it's a strength and conditioning facility, excuse me, up in Woburn. Um, and we have a lot of very talented athletes who come through. And I am lucky enough to act as a strength and conditioning coach as well as a physical therapist. So they'll kind of make some cameos in some of these videos. but. Um, the first one is Siobhan McDonough. She played or um, yeah, she played with the Utah Royals. Um, and here, let's see if I can get this video to play. All right. There we go. So she's just doing you know easy glute activation. She has a know, elastic bat band around her knee. She's just sidestepping back and forth, getting her hip abductors firing. Um, so another thing that, that doctors kind of worry about right now is that, um, you know, the kids that have been active during this pandemic may have only focused on, you know, their quadriceps and their hamstrings or um, sagittal plane movement. So it's important to incorporate lateral plane movement as well. Um, obviously to prepare them for the demands of the game. Um, so there Siobhan is just doing some glute activation. She's getting the um, gluteus medius going um, with her side steps. Let's see. This first exercise that will be shown in the next clip is the Nordic hamstring. So um, you frequently, you know, you need two players, one player to just kind of stabilize the other player's legs. Um, but what Val is going to do in this video is he's going to slowly try to lower himself down towards the ground and then come back up. 
it's very rare for an athlete to be able to do that and control their own body weight on the way down and on the way up. So Val is actually going to kind of catch his torso um, with his hands before it hits the ground. He gets pretty far and then he catches himself and just pushes himself up. So this is going to work the muscles on the back of the thigh, the hamstring muscles, which are protective from an ACL standpoint, as well as just lower extremity injury standpoint in general. Um, the next couple clips are going to be different forms of lunges. Um, so he's going to do a forward lunge, he'll do a reverse lunge, he'll do a lateral lunge, you can do a rotational lunge. The big thing here is cueing him to maintain proper alignment of that lead leg. So making sure that the knee is not caving inwards, that his core is nice and tight, and that he's not kind of wobbling all over the place, that he has really good body control and postural awareness. So here he's going to do some alternating forward lunges. You can see he has great alignment with his knees just in line with his first and second toe. So his trunk is nice and tight. He's not leaning either way. Here we can do lateral lunges. And then you can do rotational lunges, just kind of opening up the hip. Again, big thing is just body control. And then the last exercise, like I said, is calf raises. Simple, very easy. Um, you can have your players kind of hold on to uh, each other's shoulder, I guess, normally in a, in a non-COVID world um, where, where touch is okay. Um, they can also kind of hold on to a wall or a bench for balance, and they can do this single leg. Um, you know, here Siobhan is doing a double leg and she's using a little bit of a raised surface to get more range of motion. So it's going to be a little bit harder if you do it at the edge of a stair or something like that. The next couple videos are going to be core strength. So though Patushak et al. did not find that core strength made programs more effective than others, um, it's kind of like common sense, right? If you have a strong core, then you can control your body better in space, and that will help decrease your risk of injury. Um, so here we have a couple of core exercise examples. So we can go through a front plank. All right, he's pushing down into the ground, keeping his torso parallel. We can do a side plank. Same thing, one straight line. He's going to work his hip abductors as well. Here we have a side plank clam. We have another variation of a side plank clam. This is quite difficult. You can kind of see how he kind of throws himself onto the ground. We had to practice that one a little bit. Here you have a paylock press or an anti-rotation press. Um, again, I know that, that some of these involve certain pieces of equipment. Um, you know, bands tend to be pretty cheap. You can find them on Amazon fairly easily. Um, and then, you know, there, I think the remaining few exercises are all, all body weight. So um, if you don't have access to bands or, or pulleys or anything like that, you can always perform the next couple. Um, these are going to be bear crawl holds. Caitlin here goes from a four-point hold, meaning both hands and feet are down, to a three-point hold, which if you think is not difficult, I definitely dare you to try it um, because you'll feel pretty much every muscle in your core working um, with this exercise. And like I said, it, it requires minimal equipment. So here she's doing that four-point bear crawl. Her knees are elevated up the, off the ground. She's keeping a neutral spine. Here she's doing a three-point. She's adding a little bit of movement. You can go forward. You can go backwards. You can go sideways. You know, and then the last exercise, she's just doing a squat press out. The big thing here is that at, you don't see rounding of the lumbar spine with your athletes. Um, just kind of cueing them to keep their chest upright and their core nice and tight, nice and stable. Um, they'll get good benefit from that exercise. And then, you know, as we talked about before, plyometrics is basically teaching an athlete to um, create force and power, but also dissipate that, that force and that um, load. So learning to control their bodies and, and decelerate, basically absorb the shock in landing. Um, you know, here you can see Nick Firmino. Nick grew up with Mass Youth Soccer. He now plays for 
the New England Rebs. So he's a homegrown player. He comes and he trains with us at Athletic Evolution. Um, here he's just going through some very low level introductory plyometric exercises to kind of prep his nervous system before some higher level things that he does. But these are very easy to impl implement with your athletes. You know, he's just bouncing on the toes, of the, the balls of his feet, he's switching directions, he's adding some ins and outs, you know, just getting those glutes going and, and adding a little bit of, um, you know, force and load through the ankle joints. Those plyometrics aren't really going to load the knee or the hip, uh, but that's always a really, really nice warm up. And then this is kind of a nice arsenal of different plyometric drills that you can do at your soccer practices. Um, you know, the important things with plyometrics, as I said before, is it's all about quality. It really, quantity, keep the quantity low. Um, usually I'll have my athletes do, you know, about two sets of eight or two sets of six. Keep it really light, um, but I want them to be perfect reps. Um, so here, these are a couple of drills that you can do on the soccer field um, with, again, no equipment. So here, Caitlin is going through bounding. Bounding is when you go from one leg and you land on the opposite leg. So she was going sideways. Now she's going forward back. You can actually see, you know, this, she would hate me right now if I showed this, but this is actually a, a poor rep. So her knee is actually caving in when she lands. Um, and that's because these are difficult exercises. So a lot of athletes come through and I'm, in, you know, when I tell them, all right, we're going to do some hopping, you know, they kind of look at me like I have eight heads, but, you know, I want you to hop, but I want you to hop correctly. Um, and that can be quite difficult. So again, just cueing athletes to not let their knee cave inwards. So she went sideways. Now she can go forward. Right, she can add a little bit of rotation. Those are quite difficult because the knee is going to want to cave in with those. So she did a 90 degree rotation and then she did 180 degrees. Right, and you can see she's having a hard time stabilizing. You can add hops over a cone or over a soccer ball. I frequently have my athletes do it over a soccer ball, forward, backwards. Um, and so now she's adding, again, rotation. So before she was bounding, she was going from one leg and she was landing on her opposite leg. Now this gets harder because it's a hop and it's going from one leg and it's landing on the same leg. So here she's jumping off of her right leg, but she's also landing on her right leg. And this is gonna be significantly more difficult than a bound. Um, once an athlete has mastered some of the basics and is able to stick the landing with good control and control their body in space, then we can move to some higher level things like continuous hops. These are going to be more for power. Um, and you can kind of see right here, Caitlin is adding, you know, continuous um, hops side to side. She's adding a little bit of a mini bounce. Um, that can kind of help with power production. And then these are going to be higher level things that um, you may not have the most access to on the soccer field, um, but they involve box jumps, just learning to generate power. You know, you can add rotations, you know, watching control of the knee. Same thing here, just a little box drop. And then the next couple are all things that you can do at the field. So these involve jumps. Right, jumps involve two legs. You're going off with two legs and you're landing on two legs. You're trying to distribute your weight evenly among both legs. Um, so try not to favor one leg or, or land more on one leg. Um, but here, Siobhan's just doing, I think she does a couple of broad jumps, so jumps forward. She does a couple of vertical jumps, so jumps up. Um, and then she adds a little bit of rotation. But again, the big thing is just teaching athletes to land well. Nice and soft, she's bending at the knees and at the hips. It looks great. She can go forward backwards, excuse me, side to side. She can add rotations, all sorts of um, different options there. This is gonna be another higher level exercise. Um, you know, that we obviously have 
good access to in our facility. Um, any kind of band resisted vertical jump is going to help an athlete produce more force. All right. And last but not least, um, you know, talking about change of direction drills. So, um, change of direction and agility vary very slightly. So, change of direction is going to be something where an athlete can anticipate change of direction, whereas agility is where an athlete must react to some sort of stimulus, whether it be um, a verbal cue or another player, um, something like that. So the next couple are um, change of direction drills. This one is going to be anticipatory. Nick Firmino here knows exactly where he's going to change direction. Big thing is that he is bending at the knees and at the um, hips. I often cue athletes to take a lot of little steps to help decelerate um, and to actually be more powerful in the end. So here, Nick is going through an L drill. One. Perfect. And then the next couple, um, they involve partners. Um, but I'll show you some reactive cutting as well. They're kind of hidden in this clip, so I'll be sure to point those out. Um, you know, the first one that you'll see is going to be a jump. Val is going to do a vertical jump, and Caitlin's just going to push him. Um, to make it a little bit sports specific to soccer, this is in the FIFA 11. Um, you know, just teaching an athlete to be able to control their body and land, even when they receive a little bit of a bump, maybe up for a 50 50 ball or something like that. Athletes actually really enjoy this, and they kind of get a kick out of pushing each other and landing. So um, definitely a good one to throw into practice. So here, Val's jumping up. Caitlin's pushing him from the back, from the side. Here, Val's landing on one leg. Quite difficult. You know, this is another thing for power production. You know, Val has a, a cheap elastic band that he's just, you know, looped around Kaylin's hips, and Kaylin is, is trying to run as quickly as possible. Band resisted jumps again. So I'm standing on the edge of a loop as well as Kaylin, and Sam's going to just try to generate as much power as he can and get, um, you know, max vertical height. And again, landing well right? Um, landing evenly on both knees. Great. And then here, these are some of the reactive agility drills that we do um, that you can throw into your training sessions as well. Um, you know, here I have a little like semi-circle set up with cones um, and Nick is running around the circle and when I say switch, he has to quickly change directions as fast as possible. So he's reacting to my Verbal cue, okay? Nope. Awesome. Here, you know, Nick is mirroring another athlete, um, trying to keep up with his changes of direction. These are short bursts of activity, um, as they can, they can be quite tiresome. Um, but again, just kind of training the, the body to react to a stimu stimulus, excuse me, and change direction quickly. Um, and then I think the last couple are, again, Nick just reacting to my stimulus. You know, it can be an odd, um, a verbal, a verbal cue, or it can be um, a visual. So I'm also pointing and telling him which direction to go. Um, we start in the frontal plane, so just side to side, and then we progress to forward and backwards. You know, just some concluding statements. Um, athletes must slowly progress back to sport after quarantine. That's the big takeaway is don't go zero to 100. You know, monitor your player's um, tolerance to your training sessions. You know, you can show them the graphic 
um, you know, on a scale from zero to the 10, how hard are you working? We want you between a five and a seven. I don't want you completely gassed right now. I want you to have a little bit left in the tank um, so that we can slowly achieve, um, you know, the proper physical ad adaptations and gains. Um, you know, it's gonna take anywhere from four to six weeks to really recondition athletes and get them back in, in through game condition. So just respect that, you know, you're not going to be able to speed anything up. Nobody is superhuman. So, so um, take the time when you can. It's very important. Second bullet, using the time as an opportunity to get better. This was more tailored towards, um, you know, the young athletes that I was speaking to last week. Um, you know, you can view this as an obstacle or you can view it as an opportunity to um, improve your game in some way, shape or form. So um, you can use it to, to get stronger and get fitter. You can go on more runs. You can perform more exercises. Um, you know, you can watch more film, just get become a smarter player. So it's definitely um, how you view what's going on in the world that's going to, um, you know, make or break you. Keeping your baseline fitness will decrease the risk of future injury. You know, we talked about trying to keep your floor nice and high, not falling into the basement so that eventually it'll be, um, you know, when the time comes, you can reach your ceiling or your peak fitness a lot quicker than have you, um, have you deconditioned a little bit, okay? And then injury prevention programs are effective. Um, I can't say this enough, you know, they work. And when people tell me that injury prevention programs don't work, then I tell them that they're ignorant because the the data is there, the research is there, you know, anywhere from 50 to 67%, um, if we can decrease your risk of injury, then that's a win in my book. Um, and I think that any coach will agree that 15 to 20 minutes once or twice a week is not going to, um, you know, decrease your team's performance. If anything, it's going to increase your team's performance because players are gonna stay healthy and happy and, and, you know, remain on the field. Um, you know, and then the last couple of slides are just plugs for, like I said, athletic evolution. Um, I'm a strength coach there. I'm a doctor of physical therapy there. Um, with the current COVID-19 pandemic, we're offering telehealth services for patients, um, just kind of virtual consultations that um, health insurance is completely covering. So, um, you know, any of those listed on the screen are waiving co-payments and deductibles during this time. So essentially it's it's free treatment for all patients. Um, and I can kind of encourage this for any player that has a current injury that doesn't want to come in due to, you know, the, the social distancing guidelines, then this is a fantastic alternative for them. And then this is just some of my contact information. Um, like I said, a uh, former soccer player with a very large passion of helping athletes stay healthy and stay fit and stay on the field. Um, I run an organization called Just for Kicks Boston that you know specializes in ACL prevention as well as return to sport training. Um, so feel free to check out our website, justforkicksboston.com. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Just for Kicks Boston. That's the email and the, the text line that will go straight to my phone. Um, and I'll be quite responsive. Um, like I said, I, I really enjoy working with this population, um, and I am thrilled that Mass Youth Soccer, you know, invited me to speak tonight. So I'd be more than happy to answer any of your texts or, or emails or questions that you may have for me, um, because I know that we are going to open the field for questions. So. Um, Loy, I'm not totally sure how to navigate this, but uh, stop sharing. Loy, you're muted. Well, give it another try. Right now, we're going to open the forum for you guys to ask a questions to Dr. Hubbard. So I already have a couple of questions. So Garo, if you're there, please um, unmute yourself. And you have some questions about color counts. Could you please ask the questions? Ben, I will call on you in a few minutes. Garo, are you there? 
Yeah, I'm just opening it up. Give me one second. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Hello? Yes. We're listening. We can hear you. Oh, awesome. Awesome. My question was, uh, there was there was risk that you know one of the players go around the cones. I was wondering if you could uh, different color cone and like command players just thinking as well as that sharp movement. So basically, like if you have like four cones, you just kind of a certain color. And they gotta just go to them quickly. Would would that would that be an, another way to color? Can we absolutely and so, give it our own twist? Absolutely. So Garo, I gotta tell you, you broke up a little bit during that question, but I do think I got most of it. Um, so that's actually a drill that I use quite frequently, and that athletes really really enjoy. Um, is if you set down three or four or five or six cones, and they're all different colors. You can have an athlete kind of standing in the middle, maybe doing foot fires or, or jogging in place. And then when you call a color, they have to quickly react and touch that cone and get back into the middle. Exactly. Yep. So that's a fantastic one. And um, it's really easy yeah. to incorporate a soccer ball with that. So say you have two players and one player is in the center of like a box and the other player is out. Um, you can basically say, okay, you know, when the, when the player A has the ball, and they call out a color, you have to quickly sprint to that color, you're going to get a pass and then pass it back. Um, so you can make it really game-like um, and achieve, you know, the, the benefit of just reactive yeah. agility training as well. Okay, thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Dr. Right. Herbert. And then I have a, another kind of question from Steve Hughes. Steve, if you're listening, could you please ask your question about FIFA 11 and um, biometrics? Hey Julie, uh, first off, thanks very much. This has been really good. I um, really enjoyed it. Um, my question was really in regards to, I see a lot of kids that I work with across the spectrum of ages where any kind of, you know, especially within the FIFA Plus, the jump in and the, the lunges where the knee really does cave in a lot. Now, I suppose really it would be, how long would you persist with, you know, one specific activity? I mean, offering a couple of points to try and help them correct the technique prior to moving on, would you want to correct the technique with what, so say with the lunge, would you want to correct that technique before moving on, or would you want to offer two or three different stimuluses to, to work that, you know, to prevent that caving in with? Right. Um, you know, honestly, I think it kind of depends. You know, if you're working one-on-one -on -one with a player, then you can provide as many stimuluses as you want to kind of correct their form. Um, if you have a bunch of players, I know that the the guidelines of like the the ECNL, for example, they're going to allow nine players or nine nine bodies in a group. Um, so if you have a larger group right now, then providing additional stimuluses to try to correct you know the form of one player may be quite difficult. Um, so what I tend to recommend is um, really kind of driving home what we're looking for. So with plyometrics. You know, I'll sit my athletes down before we even participate in the drill and I'll say, okay, I'm looking for four things. One, you're landing softly and you're bending at your knees. Okay, you're never landing with stiff knees. Two, you're never letting your knees cave inward. Okay, you're always keeping them in line with your first and second toe. Three, you're keeping your core nice and tight. And four, you're landing evenly when you do jumps. Um, so what you can do, depending on, on what age group you're working with, is you can always pair athletes up together and just say, okay, you know, player A, you're going to be doing the jumps. Player B, I want you critiquing player A's technique. Um, so if they're not landing properly, then tell them. Um, I find that that's a really useful technique, especially, you know, when time is, is kind of limited, um, you know, and athletes like it. It kind of gives them some ownership of, you know, when your teammate is saying, hey, you know, Susie, don't let your knee cave in. Like, what are you doing? You know, Susie's like, oh, yeah, you're right. I got to be better. I got to be better. Um, so that can be a really useful technique as well. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Steve. Ben, now is your turn. Please ask your question. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, 
Julianne, your presentation, particularly with the mention of the stars, uh, indicates to me that the a lot of it is focused on higher level play. Uh, I'm working at a different level. I'm working at the grassroots with a essentially a third team of fifth graders who want to move up to the first team as sixth graders. They are extremely active. Uh, they want to get with it. They want to play. Uh, what sort of what can one do to incorporate more extra more of these uh, P11 exercises into into what they're doing. It's a tough thing to do as a strategy. It definitely is, and I I think that um, Ben, I think that that is the current obstacle right now that we face, at least in in the sports medicine field, is that we realize the importance of injury prevention, but oftentimes time is of the essence, and and kids as well as coaches just want to get the most touches on the ball as possible during a training session and, and play soccer, right? That's what we're here to do. Um, you know, I think that you can always incorporate some of these drills into practice by getting, I mean, you just have to get a little bit creative. So, um, you know, maybe in the warm-up, you're getting, you're doing touches on the ball, you're doing step ups, or you're doing um, foundation, or, or or just simple, you know, ball skill work. Um, then you can add, okay, now we're just going to take a second to do some jumps over the ball, leave the ball where it is. You know, we're going to do, you know, eight jumps side to side, and then we're going to continue on with our footwork. Um, anywhere that you can kind of sneak it in, right, and and kind of make it like a soccer drill. Um, I find that to be really, really helpful. Um, and I know that I do that with, with a bunch of my athletes. Is I, I know the reason behind why I'm having them do a certain movement pattern or a certain exercise. And then I'll toss the ball in as much as I can to make to kind of trick them and just to kind of think, okay, now we're going to play some soccer. Um, you know, you're going to do a squat and you're going to press the ball out. You know, you have the soccer ball in your hands. Kids are excited. They, you know, they, they got the ball. It's a soccer-related activity. Um, but really, they're training their bodies how to move correctly. Um, and the same can be, a, you know, set of any of, you know, the core movements you can kind of incorporate balls into um, and that kind of thing, as well as, you know, some of the jumps with, like, partner pushes, just making it transparent how it will carry over into their game so you know with with the partner pushes just saying okay you know i know this seems silly and it seems fun um but think about you know when you jump up for a header and maybe somebody gets you a little bit of a, a shove from behind you need to be able to learn how to to you know handle that and land appropriately um and i think that that um that connection that they make like oh this is actually important for the game i think that that helps them buy in a lot more Got it. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Ben and Julie. So we have uh, Dan Rudolph. Uh, he has a question. Dan, can you unmute yourself and ask the question if possible? Yeah, thanks. Um, my question is about preseason fitness testing. Yeah. Preseason fitness testing. Should it be like less intense, like less demanding this year? I would say, I would, yes, I would definitely say so, um, you know, or at least just kind of see where your players are right now. Um, you know, if, if your preseason is supposed to be in August, then you've got, you know, you've got about eight weeks for your players to get fit, um, and it might take a little bit more time. So um, I would certainly urge coaches to kind of back away from fitness testing this season, especially with the added stress and anxiety that um, has burdened athletes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, to me, that's just unnecessary, you know, stress and anxiety where you can kind of say, hey, we understand this was a really hard time. We know that you had limited access to gyms and to um, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Why don't we all, you know, do your part, do the best you can do over the summer. Here are some body weight options. And when you come in, you know, we're going to build together and we're all going to work through this and, um, you know, maybe, maybe have a fitness test, you know, two weeks into preseason or a week into preseason or something like that. But um, I would personally kind of urge coaches to, to move away from the fitness testing this season. Okay, thank you. Um, we still have a chance for one more question. Anyone? 
I guess not. So, Dr. Herbert, thank you very much for this excellent and very powerful and content uh, presentation. I really enjoy how you presented this information. For me, it was a very holistic information because you try to connect many of the aspects of soccer, like technique, uh, the physical demand, and especially the psychological component, because we understand that players are going to be um, stressed because of the times that what we live in. Um, thank you very much. I hope that we can have you again in another time with another topic. You always will be welcome for Massachusetts Soccer. Thank you. And so. All right. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it, Loy. Thank okay. you. All right. Good night.